The Last Judgment, painted by Michelangelo from 1535 to 1541, from Trois Maîtres by Alexandre Dumas. In 1535, Michelangelo was at last enabled to occupy himself exclusively with the execution of his Last Judgment, to which he devoted no less than eight to nine years. This immense and unique picture in which the human figure is represented in all possible attitudes, where every sentiment, every passion, every reflection of thought, and every aspiration of the soul are rendered with inimitable perfection, has never been equaled and never will be equaled in the domain of art. This time, the genius of Michelangelo simply attacked the infinite. The subject of this vast composition, the manner in which it is conceived and executed, the admirable variety and the learned disposition of the groups, the inconceivable boldness and firmness of the outlines, the contrast of light and shade, the difficulties, I might almost say the impossibilities, vanquished, as if it were all mere play, and with a happiness that savors of prodigy, the unity of the whole and the perfection of the details make the last judgment the most complete and the greatest picture in existence. It is broad and magnificent in effect, and yet each part of this prodigious painting gains infinitely when seen and studied quite near, and we do not know of any easel picture worked upon with such patience and finished with such devotion. The painter could only choose one scene, several isolated groups in this appalling drama which will be enacted on the last day in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, where all the generations of man shall be gathered together, and yet admire the omnipotence of genius. With nothing but a single episode in a restricted space, and solely by the expression of the human body, the artist has succeeded in striking you with astonishment and terror, and in making you really a spectator of the supreme catastrophe. At the base of the picture, very nearly in the center, you perceive the boat of the inferno, a fantastic reminiscence borrowed from pagan tradition, in accordance with which first the poet and then the painter were pleased to clothe an accursed being with the form and occupation of Charon. Charon with the eyes of burning embers gathering together with a gesture all these souls and striking with his oar those who hesitate. From Dante's Inferno. It is impossible to form an idea of the incredible science displayed by Michelangelo in the varied contortions of the damned, heaped one upon the other in the fatal bark. All the violent contractions, all the visible tortures, all the frightful shrinkings that suffering, despair, and rage can produce upon human muscles are rendered in this group with a realism that would make the most callous shudder. To the left of this bark you see the gaping mouth of a cavern. This is the entrance to purgatory, where several demons are in despair because they have no more souls to torment. This first group, which very naturally attracts the spectator's attention, is that of the dead, whom the piercing sound of the eternal trumpet has awakened in their tombs. Some of them shake off their shrouds, others with great difficulty open their eyelids made heavy by their long sleep. Towards the angle of the picture, there is a monk who is pointing out the divine judge with his left hand. This monk is the portrait of Michelangelo. The second group is formed of the resuscitated ones, who ascend of themselves to the judgment, these figures, many of them are sublime in expression, rise more or less lightly into space, according to the burden of their sins, of which they must render account. The third group, also ascending to the right of Christ, is that of the blessed. Among all these saints, some of whom show the instrument of their execution, others the marks of their martyrdom, there is one head especially remarkable for beauty and tenderness. It is that of a mother who is protecting her daughter, turning her eyes filled with faith and hope towards the Christ. Above the host of saints you see a fourth group of angelic spirits, some bearing the cross, others the crown of thorns, instruments and emblems of the Saviour's passion. The fifth group, parallel to the fourth which we have just pointed out, is composed of angels, such at least they seem to be by the splendor of their youth and the aerial lightness of their movements, and these also bear, as if in triumph, other emblems of the divine expiation the column, the ladder, and the sponge. Above these angels on the same plane as the saints and to the left of Christ is the choir of the just, the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, the martyrs, and the holy personages form this sixth group. The seventh is the most horrible of all and the one in which the art of Michelangelo has displayed itself in all its terrific grandeur. It is composed of the rejected ones, 
overwhelmed by the decree and led away to punishment by the rebel angels, the very coldest spectator could not remain unmoved by this spectacle. You believe yourself in hell. You hear the cries of anguish and the gnashing of the teeth of the wretched, who, according to the terrible Dantesque expression, vainly desire a second death. The eighth, ninth, and tenth groups occupying the base of the composition, are composed, as we have already said, of the bark of Charon, the grotto of purgatory, and the angels of judgment, eight in number, blowing their brazen trumpets with all their might to convoke the dead from the four quarters of the earth. Finally, in the eleventh group, in the centre, very near the upper part of the picture, between the two companies, the blessed, and seated upon the clouds, the sovereign judge with a terrible action hurls his malediction upon the condemned. The virgin turns away her head and trembles. On Christ's right is Adam, and on his left St. Peter. They have exactly the same positions assigned to them by Dante in his Paradiso. This immense work was exhibited to the public on Christmas Day, 1541. It had cost eight years of work. Michelangelo was then sixty-seven years old. 